Coming up on DTNS, Hay and Apple come to an agreement just in time for WWDC, where Apple announces they're moving to an ARM-based processor, allowing iOS apps to run on a Mac, and a whole fresh load of features for iOS, watchOS, and more. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, June 22nd, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. And joining us today, I'm very excited to have Terrence Gaines and Nika Monford, hosts of Snob OS Cast. Welcome, y'all. It's good to have you. Hello. Thanks for having us. Hey, how's it going, everybody? It's good. Uh, I always hear you talking about Apple stuff, so it was perfect to have you on to talk about all this WWDC stuff uh, that we've got going on. I mean, they actually they actually announced a lot today. Sometimes not so much, but today was pretty full. It was yep. jam-packed today. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's get right to it. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. 9 to 5 Google notes that Canary builds of Chrome OS feature nearby sharing in settings, although it doesn't appear to be functional yet. Google's nearby sharing feature lets Android users share links, photos, and other media with other Android devices, similar to how AirDrop works for Apple. The feature will also be available through the Chrome browser on Mac, Windows, and Linux. OnePlus CEO Pete Liu and co-founder Carl Pei both tweeted using the hashtag New Beginnings. Teasing, obviously, something new. Uh, some leaks indicate OnePlus is close to launching an affordable 5G phone called the OnePlus Z. And Friday, Pay tweeted a promo for the 2014 OnePlus One. That one cost $299. So if, if they were going to put out a $299 5G phone, that'll be interesting. Bloomberg sources say that Apple emailed iOS developers in China that their games will need a license to continue operating as of July. China previously In China, previously games could be published in China on iOS while awaiting uh, official authorization. China requires all paid games and also those with in-app purchases to receive a license. Big news right before the show, Microsoft announced it's shutting down Mixer, its live gaming streaming service, as of July 22nd. Microsoft will migrate all the streamers and partners to Facebook Gaming. And Mixer viewers with Ember Balances channel subscriptions or Mixer Pro subscriptions will receive Xbox gift card credit. Microsoft will integrate its xCloud game streaming service into Facebook gaming as well. So just kind of hand them the keys to Facebook. Spotify announced it's testing a feature called in-app offers that puts an advertiser's link on a podcast's episode page. The feature is being tested in the U.S. on the last podcast on the left and in Germany on the podcast Herrenstech. And ARM had a big day because Japan's new Fugaku supercomputer became the first ARM-based computer to achieve the top spot in Linpack benchmark tests, offering 2.8 times the performance of the former number one Summit supercomputer. Fugaku uses 7.3 million V8A CPU cores in servers across 400 racks with a total memory bandwidth of 163 petabytes per second. All right, we've got a couple things to talk about before we get to WWDC. What's the first of them, Sarah? Well, this one's Apple-related. The Hey email app, we talked about it a lot last week, and the saga seems to be resolved, at least for now. Apple objected that the app didn't do anything after install. Apple said, that we don't want that. Hey didn't want to use Apple's in-app payment system for signups because of that 30% that Apple takes. Apple doesn't let developers mention any other options in their app, so it was a bit of a standoff. As a compromise... Hey is now giving users a free temporary Hey email account with a randomized address for 14 days so that the app is functional. It's meant for things like a temporary sign-up or a Craigslist listing or something like that where you're anonymized. Hey also accelerated its enterprise partners to launch on Hey so the app now can say it's an enterprise tool. Apple published the bug fix version of the app that's been held up and Hey submitted a new version of the app with this added functionality. So this this settles it for now. I'm sure that Basecamp, which makes hay, uh, is probably going to make some hay uh, around this again at some point in the future. Uh, but at least they, they get to ha be in the App Store and stay in the App Store. Nika, I know you do app development. Have you been following this whole thing? Not so much. Um, as you guys know, I CTO a small startup. So it's pretty much I've kind of offloaded most of that dev work to the to the person we have. So I haven't been following it too closely, but I, I've seen a little bit about it. Yeah. How do you feel about the App Store being re so requiring you to use their in-app payment system for stuff? Well, I think because Apple is so huge on on protecting, you know, your data, I think it's just a way for them to have some of that, you know, Apple control that they like to have. They like to keep things in-house. We know what's going on. We know if something breaks or if something goes wrong, 
we know that we pretty much have the ownership of that. And it, and it leads to the credence where they're not introducing so many different options. And Terrence, I know uh, I saw you nodding your head when, when we mentioned that it was uh, it was getting enterprise features so it could slip in that way, right? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's the hook to get them in for now. But sooner or later, um, this Apple's app, the way they do their apps, it's sooner or later, they're going to have to give on something. Now, I don't know if this is the the the, the cow that broke the camel's back, the straw that broke the camel's back, but sooner or later, they're going to have to make some major maybe not major at the very least announce something that is going to make all the app developers feel a little bit better before they start to revolt in mass. Yeah. Well, I mean, and Apple, if Apple wanted to say, oh, this is the way we do it. Sorry. I mean, you, you, you want to be in the app store, you have to do it this way, but there are these exceptions that people keep pointing out. Mm. Well, what about this app? This app isn't what you say it has to be. And you, they, they're there still. So that's what it's like. Does Apple communicate more? Do they change their policies? Something's got to give. Right. right. Bloomberg reports Nintendo is pulling back from the mobile game market. Two years ago, Nintendo expected smartphone games to be a billion dollar business for them. It hasn't been. In fact, in May, Nintendo president Shuntaro Furukawa said, we are not necessarily looking to continue releasing many new applications for the mobile market. Sensor Tower data from February through May showed Nintendo mobile app revenue falling at a time when other mobile games, including Nintendo Switch games, were rising. The one exception for Nintendo was their Animal Crossing app, Pocket Camp, uh, but that was riding on the coattails of a Switch app. And it doesn't seem like Nintendo wants to play that game of, of charging a lot of in-app payments, uh, creating multiple versions based on one particular game, which is what a lot of companies do to make successful mobile apps. DNA, uh, Nintendo's mobile development partner, says that, in fact, no new mobile apps are expected from Nintendo until near the end of the current fiscal year. I mean, it sounds to me like Nintendo is like this, what we're doing right now is working for us really well and mobile can't be working very well for Nintendo or they would put more, you know, more uh, R&D into it. But did they ever try to start with? It seems like they kind of just messed around a little bit. Now they're saying, oh, it didn't work. Well, it didn't work because you didn't put that much effort into <laughs> it. As soon as the Switch took off, everybody said, oh, we're going to do Switch now. Yeah. yeah. And I think they may be playing into that because the Switch now is so popular and people are clamoring to to buy it. They're like, hey, let's keep this cash cow going and not introduce too many other things that may siphon off from the mainstream. Let's keep it simple. Everyone buy a Switch and, and play your Animal Crossing there. Yeah, it really does feel like they didn't want to do it in the first place. And the, when mm -hmm. the Switch started doing well, they're like, great, great, great. That's what we want Don't to need do to anymore. anymore. Yeah. Well, and remember a couple of years ago, the story was, wow, Nintendo was really late to this mobile yeah. market. You know, everyone's doing it. Like, what is Nintendo doing? They've really, they, you know, they really dropped the ball and <laughs> the company had other plans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and man, maybe they're like, you know what? That mobile market requires you to do stuff we're not comfortable doing to our customers, you know, loot right. boxes and all, all that sort of thing. We got what works. It's going good for us. Let's not try and do too much. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, folks, to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. All right, let's get into the WWDC announcements, starting with new Apple chips for Macs, transitioning to Apple chips designed with ARM, which they just referred to as Apple Silicon. Now, they didn't announce a new chip. In fact, they even showed demos running on the current iPad A12X or A12Z chip. Uh, in fact, they didn't announce any products, which is not unusual at WWDC. This is all about the heart or all about the software. So this was mostly for developers to know, okay, you're going to have a new version of Xcode. You're going to have Universal 2, which will allow you to make a single binary across architectures. They talked Microsoft, Adobe already doing that for their products. Uh, they talked about Rosetta 2. So on the user side, you'll be able to have your Intel apps translate and work on Apple Silicon at install dynamic translation for just in time and Java. Uh, they talked about virtualization. They talked about iPhone and iPad apps running unmodified on Mac. So you can just bring those over. You won't have to do anything with them. You might want to for the interface, but you wouldn't have to. Uh, but mostly they talked about the quick start program for developers so that developers could start testing their apps on the new platform. And to that end, they're selling a DTK, which is essentially a Mac mini with an A12Z system on a chip inside. Uh, you have to apply to get it at developer.apple.com. They'll start shipping them this week. You pay $500 and you have to agree to return it to Apple 
at the end of the program. So you're not buying a piece of hardware, you're you're basically renting it. Yeah, yeah just, just one correction, Tom. Uh, you said Apple Silicon. They kept saying Apple Silicon. So I just wanted to correct you. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> Silicon. Silicon. Yeah. It no, I kept thinking they were going to... I thought they I kept thinking they were going to come up with an Apple-y name for this. And and you're right. They just they just kept saying Apple Silicon. Yeah, you know, it was I noticed that too, Terrence, that that um we well, were talking about before the show that ARM was never specifically mentioned. And you know, a lot of people were like, "Ooh, what's that about?" And I think that Apple just wants it to be an Apple chip. I mean, the fact that they're working with ARM is fine, but once you hear that, you're like, "Well, hold on. Am I getting the, the Apple chip, or am I getting something else, or am I getting one of these Intel chip uh, MacBooks that are now discounted because you know they've got this cool new thing going on?" And that's just what Apple does. I will say, as you know, I'm not a developer, but I'm certainly a you know a Mac OS user um, all day, every day. The idea to be able uh, to run either iOS or iPad apps on my Mac, uh, you know. That is such a brave new world. I'm so excited about how I will use that. Um, it just opens up so many possibilities for me not to be switching between devices based on what I want to do. Um, so that's that that was that was kind of the standout for me. Right, and, and I think. Go ahead, Taryn. I was gonna say, and I saw something on Twitter. Uh, somebody tweeted, "Well, what's since this is the case now, what's stopping Apple from running Mac OS on an iPad?" I think mm -hmm. that was kind of like the whole question. It will be interesting to see mm -hmm. how they keep everything separate if everything is all interconnected now. And that's essentially what I was about to say. So oh, well, it, I should have let you say it. <laughs> no, you got it. But what it, what it seems like to me is, so if you're saying that I can run uh, iOS on Mac OS, so are you, what's the, what's the end result here? Are you trying to drive people to use their Macs more, their actual laptops more, or... Is it just because I think more people are using their iPads more than just about anything? So my my question is, what's the long term strategy for this? Is this just mm -hmm. to, you know, put the focus more on this new Apple Silicon, you know, laptop you need to get? Or is it something just to say, hey, you have the, the flexibility if you're already on your Mac to go ahead and open up, you know, something you would normally switch to your iPad or your iPhone for? It does seem like the end goal is to just blur the lines between mm -hmm. all of those. Uh, we should mention before we move on, the first Mac with Apple Silicon will be by the end of the year. Uh, they say they'll transition over the next two years, but there are still new Intel Macs in the pipeline. It'll be curious to see how all this Rosetta stuff works in practice when you get a new one with the Apple stuff inside. Uh, but the, we'll wait until they, they announce those products to start spending too much time thinking about that. To your point about the blurring of the lines, Mac OS Big Sur really felt like it was trying to become iOS, like it was mm -hmm. trying to look like iOS. The dock looked like the iPad OS dock. The finder now starts to look more like files. The menu bar is translucent. Control center is coming to the Mac. Uh, the notification center now has notifications and widgets redesigned just like iOS. In fact, messages and maps are the iOS mm -hmm. or iPad OS versions running on uh, Macs. It'll be interesting to see how those run on your Intel once you get uh, Mac OS Big Sur. But uh, that that really showed that I'm like, I'm like, and, and the Verge folks were saying this too, why aren't Macs touchscreen? Because you've got a lot of controls that look mm -hmm. like I want to touch them there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really one of those things where, like you said, the lines are just so blurred. I'm not sure what the ultimate, you know, goal is because it's like you can sit your iPad next to um, the new OS and it essentially looks the same, but like to your point, you can't touch it. And what you're going to want to do is to touch your Mac because you're going to get so used to what that interface is on your iPad. You're going to start trying to touch your Mac with the lines being blurred. You're going to have to kind of flip your brain to say, okay, I'm actually on a laptop and not an iPad, even though they look the same. Yeah. Or, or you can spend three, four hundred dollars and get a touchpad uh, keyboard for your iPad. There you just do the touchscreen. <laughs> well, but the Apple doesn't like the Apple's like, look what we did. We gave you Big Sur and these fancy new processors. So why don't you buy a three thousand dollar MacBook Pro? <laughs> that's uh, I think that's what the drive is to go to the to their new silicon uh, laptop. Well, I mean, I think it, I think it kind of invigorates the Mac market, which you know has has you know with all the new form factors that Apple has introduced over the years, I mean, it's chugged along, but um, it hasn't been you know like a surge in Mac sales for some time. Yeah. Uh, also, come. 
Oh, go ahead. Nico. No, I'll just say I completely agree with Sarah. Yep, uh, me too. Uh, so also coming to Mac OS Big Sur Safari uh, privacy report button. So when you're visiting a site, you can see what trackers were blocked, uh, what kind of trackers they try to do, what kind of information they might have about you. Uh, it's going to start monitoring saved passwords for possible breaches. Uh, the web extension API will let you bring extensions from other browsers. There'll be a new category in the Mac App Store for that. Uh, those extensions will have permissions where you can allow them for a day. Uh, for a particular site or for everything. Uh, there are also some other customizations controls. They're adding icons finally to tabs on Safari. Uh, you'll be able to hover over tabs for preview. There's built-in translation coming to Safari and uh, icons show in the search field as well. All right, let's talk about iOS 14. Uh, they're getting a something on the home screen called the app library. So you can automatically hide you know, those later pages of your home screen of apps that you no longer look at and go right to the end and see the app library, which basically automatically organizes apps into folders that are a little bigger. Each folder has like four icons that you can touch and launch directly, or you can open that section into a larger number of them. Uh, there's a grouping called suggestions, which are things that it thinks you might want to use based on your previous usages. Uh, there's one called recently added, which is stuff that you've just added recently. Makes sense. Uh, other ones like arcade, social, you might want to guess. Uh, tap to hide app pages, like I said, gets you to that library faster. Widgets now come in a variety of sizes that can be moved into your home screen pages, uh, not just on that today view. Uh, there's something called Smart Stack that can automatically show the right widget. So you have Smart Stack up there and it'll show you like your weather and traffic in the morning and then maybe your calendar during the day, et cetera. It'll try to guess what you want. Uh, they're also bringing picture in picture to iOS 14, uh, making Siri not take over your whole home screen. It's now just a little blob down at the bottom. There's a translate app uh, that can work offline. So you, even when you're in a basement in Japan in a wrestling shop trying to buy something for your friend Justin, you can still translate. <laughs> maybe, you know, something I might have pulled out of my own experience there. Uh, there's also messages, maps, CarPlay, uh, app clips, small part of an app that will pop up even if you don't have the app. So if you're paying for parking and you haven't downloaded the app for the city of Santa Monica, say, uh, App Clips would be able to say, here, you know, just pay for parking. You have to use Apple Pay. You have to log in with Apple. So we'll see how many of these App Clips actually ha happen out there. Also, Find My allows third parties. Uh, and there's a bunch of stuff coming to iPad OS 14. They, they made a big deal out of sidebars, a lot of that Siri stuff. The big thing that they didn't talk about, it was just on a slide and they've confirmed since, was okay. you can set your default email and browser apps in iPadOS and iOS. So yes, they confirmed this to CNET. You'll be able to set Chrome as your default browser in iOS 14. I don't think they realized how how valuable that information <laughs> is to most people that yes, you should talk about that. Yeah, yeah. I was going to mention that. I put it in the notes, so I'm glad you picked that up because, like Nika said, that's what everybody's interested in. But I wanted to throw this to Nika. They were talking about the app libraries, and I don't know if y'all know, but she is OCD when it comes to her, uh, <laughs> how she arranges it. So now they're doing that for you. How do you feel about not being able to control where and how and when you put apps? So I'm not so sure yet. I'm going to have to wait to see it. And he was talking about, so all of my apps are in folders. And inside of the folders, all the apps are in alphabetical order. And all the folders mm -hmm. are in alphabetical order. So if they don't use my same naming conventions, because some of them I have like some weird names for, for folders. So it, it'll be interesting to see how much of the control they take away from me with that. <laughs> <laughs> also heard a lot of folks say widgets, that just looks like Windows 10. Uh, and, and to that I say, great, yes. Yes. I want them. I am so <laughs> excited about this. I'm so excited about, and, and Nika, I'm, I'm maybe not as OCD as you, but I am also a folder person and I have like 11 pages of, I mean, I just yeah. have too many apps and most of them I don't even use and it's just a mess. So I, I, this is like such a great excuse for me to just start over and be like, what am I actually doing here? What kind of widgets are going to help me? I love the fact that my home screen can be a lot more customized. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, I was, I was really impressed by this and I and don't Tara, care if it looks like windows 10, they did it first. Kudos. And Terrence, you mentioned this before. One of the things that you hoped would be that Apple would introduce the tiles 
like on, I think it was like the Windows phone. And when yep. I saw that, I was like, there's Terrence's window tile. <laughs> yep, uh, yep. I've been talking about that for years. So finally they've done it, but I'll be interested to see how up to date they are. You know, if it is it live or mm-hmm. is it like refreshed every 30 minutes, every hour? Is it up to date? What, what sort of uh, refresh rate will that be? Yeah, it might depend on the app developer, but but Apple can set the standard there, right? By right. by having the widgets for their own apps. Uh, yeah, and I'm also I like that idea of app clips so much, but the fact that you have to use Apple Pay and Apple Login uh, makes me wonder just how widely supported it will be. And if it's not widely supported, then it becomes less useful. Right. Uh, all right, those are the big big announcements. We also had a few other announcements uh, along with iPad OS. For some reason, uh, they talked about AirPods, uh, but a cool Two, two new features coming to AirPods, automatic device switching between mm-hmm. iCloud devices. Uh, so if you've got the AirPods associated with both devices and you switch from listening to podcasts on your phone to listening on your tablet, it'll automatically detect that and switch your AirPods so you don't have to do anything. They're also adding spatial audio that adapts to your head movements by taking not only motion from your head, but input from the screen you're looking at if you're watching video uh, to keep that spatial audio from moving around, right? Because you're moving your head, but the audio shouldn't. Uh, They're going to support 5.1, 7.1, and even Dolby Atmos. Uh, They also announced uh, new features for the pencil. Uh, Scribble to iPad. You can handwrite into any text field. Uh, You can make shapes and then pause at the end, and it will convert it to a standard shape. So you can just rough sketch like an octagon, and it'll make it a perfect octagon. Uh, You can select text that is written like you would text that was typed, and then move it around, copy and paste it, add space after it. Uh, So that's cool if you're just handwriting stuff, and you're like, oh, wait, I want to insert stuff, or I want to copy this into a notepad or something. And it can, uh, with that same feature, detect addresses and phone numbers. Pencil or AirPod features... Get anybody excited here? I'm not much of an AirPod person, but I certainly am an audio person. And all I could think of uh, during that, it was sort of, you know, it was a short part of the the overall keynote was VR headset audio. Like somehow there's, there's, you know, this is, this is the beginning of where we're going with this whole spatial audio thing. I don't know if it's AirPods. Somewhere in an Apple lab. They're yeah, building like, something. Do they connect together? Are they two different products? But that's exactly where my mind went, especially because my Oculus Quest, uh, the audio is fine, but it could be better. Could be a lot yeah, better. Well, yeah. What I was going to say about the AirPods is it, it's the adaptive listening. Is that in place of Dolby Atmos? They said it it interoperates with Dolby Atmos, but my question is, if it accepts Dolby Atmos, will I have to buy a license for Dolby Atmos? Like I've got a pair of uh, gaming headsets that are compatible with Dolby Atmos, but I had to buy a license. Hmm. How is that going to work in Apple's environment to where if I if it operates with Dolby Atmos, then I have to pay for it? And how do I pay for it? And is that take the place of that? I was curious about that, kind of confused, but. I definitely want to learn more about that. They made it sound like it would just, like if Dolby Atmos is in the video you're playing, uh, it will work. My well, guess is, based on what you're saying, Terrence, is that Apple I, yeah, Apple Store stuff has already paid the license for you. Anything else? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Okay. Well, it'll be interesting to see if they already pay that for Dolby Atmos. Mm-hmm. You definitely have to buy that separately. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Uh, also, we got new features on Watch OS 7, uh, new ways to handle faces. You can make your own face uh, for the watch and share them with stuff. Uh, they're adding cycling directions. They're ans- adding dance, cool down, and functional strength training to workout, uh, renaming the activity app to the fitness app and adding a summary view of your workouts to it. Uh, but the one they spent the most time on was sleep tracking. Uh, they have a thing called Wind Down that works with the iPhone uh, to set a reminder. You, you tell it when you want to go to sleep, and it'll help you try to hit that goal of consistently going to sleep at the same time. It'll automatically turn on Do Not Disturb, offer shortcuts to cool things like you know relaxing music. Uh, sleep mode will also dim your watch and turn it off uh, when you go to sleep uh, and then wake you in the morning with gentle haptic taps, which would definitely not wake me up, but uh, may work for <laughs> some people. Uh, there's also uh, breath analysis. If you want to see how well you slept, it'll it'll track your breaths. Um, there's And uh, they, they showed up a- automatic washing detection. So it'll automatically tell if you're washing your hands with some machine learning and then count down from 20. Uh, that That's something that'll be helpful for the next year or so, I imagine. But I, I don't know. How do you all feel about the sleep mode? It's funny because my my the Apple Watch is really more functional than my Fitbit Versa 2 that I wear. 
but a lot of the, you know, like the sleep mode stuff, activity stuff, uh, let me remind you to, you know, start winding down for bed or, you know, would you, you know, you know, meditative uh, shortcuts. I'm like, well, okay, that's cool that it's coming to the Apple Watch if no one's ever used that stuff before. But other watches do have that. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the activity stuff, I was like, yeah, we have that. Some of the like dancing and it knowing the difference between moving your arms and moving your legs, you know, how many times have I been like, okay, I have 50 steps left in this hour. And I just like do like a, like fist bump for like 50 times. And then it goes like, <laughs> okay, cool. You took steps. Well, it didn't obviously, <laughs> if it knew the difference, it's like, that is actually helpful data, you know, for overall exercise. If you, if you're really a stats person, and you want a much more accurate sense of how many calories did I burn? You know, how, you know, how's my overall fitness BMI, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of, it's exciting if you're, if you want to go ham with, uh, with a bunch of numbers. <laughs> yeah. My thing was the Apple, the watch, the wash, ha wash your hands detection. You know, I noticed that Apple's going to really start dry snitching on a lot of people because we know, <laughs> we, know <laughs> we know for a fact, people do not wash their hands. So maybe this would be just a little bit of a nudge. And if you're not washing them in the right, the white, the right direction, they'd be like, Hey, 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 I'm gonna need you to wash it a little bit longer. So I think that's very added yep. I forward to that. Yep. And I think for the sleep tracking, people have been asking for it. I was surprised at how clamoring people were to have a native sleep tracking app you know, for the iPhone, because I know there are a couple of that, there's one that, that I use that's, you know, of course not native to, to Apple, but people were, I was surprised at the amount of attention that adding this type of feature natively was to people. It, it, it doesn't really ring too much of a bell with me, but apparently a lot of people really wanted that. So yeah, I, I I charge my watch overnight. I don't want to have to charge it while I shower, which I know what people with sleep tracking. I don't want to have something on my wrist while I'm sleeping. But you're right. A lot of people, a lot of people like that. Yeah, and I don't sleep with my watch either. It, it, I was like, I need to kind of have my wrist free. So. You know, <laughs> but I used to say that too. And now yeah. I'm like, there's nothing better than you just looking at being like, what time is it in the morning? <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a little, it's a little thing. But uh, mm -hmm. I wear my, and also I like to know, you know, how long it thought I slept, you know, and how many times I moved around and stuff like that. It's good data. All right. Not too many uh, other things. Uh, let's try to catch them up all together here. Uh, they announced that the home app will now suggest automations when you set up a device, automatically surfing items that are surfacing items that need attention, like an unlocked door, uh, some adaptive lighting to adjust color temp throughout the day. You can set up activity zones for cameras, use facial recognition on your doorbell so it can tell you who's at the door. If it's a friend of yours, you can watch the live view of your cameras on Apple TV. Uh, they also announced picture in picture coming to TV OS. Uh, the Apple TV app coming to Sony and Vizio later this summer and Apple TV plus original foundation got a trailer. Uh, they talked a lot about privacy uh, and that devs can now let you convert your account to sign in with Apple because they consider Apple to be a, a, a more secure way to sign in uh, location data. They will now give you the option to share approximate location instead of exact location. Uh, mic and camera, your current or recent mic or camera use will show up and a status bar indicator will show up when any app has turned on your camera so that you know it's on. Same for your mic. Uh, apps must ask before tracking you across apps and sites from other companies. So just like asking for location, if they wanna track you outside of their own app, then they'll have to ask you for that. Uh, and uh, apps in the App Store are going to get a, a, a privacy label that will tell you uh, what kind of information they track, what they use it for, how long they store things, et cetera. They compared it to a nutritional label for privacy. Yep, more snitching for Apple. <laughs> <laughs> they are definitely going to tell on you if you are doing something, anything nefarious at all, whether it be actually or accidental. <laughs> right. And, you know, it wasn't the point of the show, obviously, but this was not a live WWDC with an audience. Uh, in fact, it wasn't live at all uh, for anybody who's like, that's an amazing production value, which it was. I mean, that would be pretty impossible if it was live um, or at least uh, a lot harder. But I liked it. I thought it flowed. I mean, it was corny in places, but Apple keynotes We're always are. Look at that, yeah. Yeah, and just kind of knowing that because I, at a... Uh, it, it, in an auditorium, there's, you know, there's, there's kind of ambient noise and you're not kind of close up on, on any of the folks on stage. 
And there's always a some part where there's a lull or something doesn't go right. And you always sort of are waiting for that, you know, like that cringy stuff. And so I hope, and I'm not talking about Apple, but I hope all keynotes are like this in the future. <laughs> you know, it's concise to the point. Make it as splashy as you want. You know, get the information out there. It was the fun. Demos maybe, all work. Yeah. Maybe I just liked it because it was different, but I, I, I would be fine with this format going forward. Agreed. Yeah, but I think some hardcore folks. We want our our normal experience. Yeah. We don't I definitely saw a lot of that I, on Twitter. Yeah. Like this is, you know, it's taking away, you know, the special nature of the oh, show. I'm like, goodness. it's just because you couldn't go. Yeah. Uh, well, everybody, not being able to go. Yeah, right. Everybody who wants to join the conversation about Apple and everything else we talk about on the show, you can join our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at Patreon.com/dtns. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including John Specht, Juan D. Hernandez, and Paul Thiessen. And very special thanks to Terrence Gaines and Nika Montford for being with us on the show today. Um, such a pleasure. Uh, let folks know what, what y'all do and, and where everyone can find you. So, yeah, most definitely. Yeah, you can definitely find us at uh, Snob OS Cast. Uh, you can, that's all on all social media, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can... Read, write us a letter at snoboscast at gmail.com. Or if you want to leave a comment on our website, we are at snoboscast.com. Yep. Check us out. I'm a listener. I really enjoy hearing y'all talk. I, I I get good perspectives on Apple stuff, but you have a section where you talk about non-Apple stuff. You have a section where you talk about for the culture. Uh, the, the whole thing is enjoyable. I highly recommend folks go check it out. Snoboscast.com. Uh, you can also support our show at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. And we know not everybody needs a mask, but if you do, we got them for you at the DTNS store. Go check them out. Dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Please write us early and often. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>